Hi, David Moore, Equity Vantage with Bob Smith and Peregrine Private Capital. And I always like to talk about the little nuggets of knowledge. And, and you know, people that hear me talk, any, anytime somebody like in person or I actually, I, I, I was at a oil gas conference last week speaking and, and the guy that owns the company is sort of a fast talker like I am. And, and so the, the attendees were joking with me whether, whether Troy spoke quicker than I did or vice versa. But uh, they sort of questioned whether we're related, I think. But, you know, the thing is that, that people don't think about uh, a lot or they, I shouldn't say they don't think about it. You don't know what you don't know, right? I mean, I gave a presentation at the CCM Global Conference a few years ago, and the the, the uh, presentation was was titled "You Can Do What You Don't Know," and and the idea is that that yeah. you know take a look at it, get that little nugget of knowledge. You don't have to know everything about it. You just have to know people that can help you get there, right? So. If we look at Section One Twenty One, the Universal Exclusion, and we sort of dovetail that in with what you were just talking about, the number of people, you know, we look behind us and you got one of four floors occupied. Where are those people? It's not like they're not working, but they're working from home, right? So if you think about Section 121, which is the universe exclusion for home sale, and, and I still have people call up that think old Section 1034 still applies, where you, you so pre-97, you, you lived in your home for a couple of years, you sold it, you had two years to buy a new home of equal or greater value. If you're 55 or older, you had a one-time lifetime exclusion of $125,000. And that was replaced in 97 by 121 that says, if you live in a property for two out of the preceding five, you get a quarter million tax-free personally, or a half million as a married couple. Sorry, I'm talking quickly. If you wanna know more about it, go take a look at Equity Advantage on YouTube, type in 121, you'll hear it. But you know the idea is that a lot of times that 250 or 500 is woefully short. I would argue 1034 is probably better than 121 on a lot of people's homes today. I mean, if I look at downtown Northeast Portland, for example, you've got a situation where maybe the average little house is a half million bucks, and how long's that person lived there? You know, the, a single person is gonna have gains well in excess of that, let alone you get in the burbs and some of the high-end areas. So your choice, and, and I've got a buddy, for example, that lives in San Francisco, and his house is worth a couple million bucks today, right? I mean, and he paid 500 for it a few years ago. So he's looking at a situation where he might have a million dollars in gain in excess of what that half million exclusion is going to give him. And, you know, really, he's got a choice. I gave him a hard time because I said, well, Buzz, you got to move out of it. And I said, but don't rent it because you won't be able to get the tenants out of it, <laughs> okay? So it is San Francisco. But uh, you've got a couple of options there, and you need to understand if you just sell it as your home, you're going to have a big tax hit. If you move out of it and season the thing as an investment, you could then convert the property to a, a, an investment property. As long as you sell it within three years of moving out, you're still entitled to the exclusion, and you take and, and exchange your overage into a DST, right? or an upgrade or something like that. And I think that's a wonderful thing. The other thing that's happened though, is that we have people that were in these offices now working from home. So I would bet there's a bunch of people out there that now are treating a piece of their home as a home office. Their tax people told them to do this and they start taking depreciation on it. And I will tell you, if you've been doing that for more than three out of the last five years, you're now in a situation where you sell that home. You think it's just all 121, your primary residence, but a piece of it's going to go 1031. Now, that's not a bad thing because your gains potentially are well beyond those numbers, too. So I just think it's really important as you change the usage of stuff, just the way the world is changing, you're looking at things that really maybe accidentally or happening could really help you. So, Bob, I don't know. I just sort of spit a whole bunch of information out real quickly. But uh, what kind of comments do you have uh, for our audience with respect to what I just said? I think it just, um, as you mentioned, uh, it's the, the 121 is archaic from a valuation standpoint, meaning that single-family homes 
from a valuation standpoint, have greatly outpaced that. And even with the CRE, commercial real estate, recession uh, coming at us, single family homes should continue to stand up very well from a valuation standpoint because there's something like a 5 million unit shortage nationally of single family homes because after the single family home collapse in 2007, 2008 or prior to that, almost all the uh, housing development was single family homes because if you could fog a mirror, you could buy a house. Then the single family home market collapsed. It didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out the primary beneficiary was gonna be multifamily because the whole generation of never should have been owners went back to being renters and there simply wasn't enough inventory. So most house, most of the housing development post 2007, 2008 has been multifamily, okay? And so that's actually, I think in many respects, helped mm -hmm. increase or accelerate the valuation or value of single family homes. And now we have a big shortage and that shortage isn't something that can be fixed short term. So valuations of single family homes have greatly outstripped what section 121 gives you by way of safe harbor. So you need to be aware, as David just mentioned, of other op options that may be available to you specific to that overage that isn't covered by 121, whether it's an opportunity zone, whether it's a DST. You need to take the time to educate yourself with regard to everything all the options on the table before you pull the trigger and make a sale. And so I think that's a very, very good point on your part that if, you, if you're not impulsive and you take the time to inform yourself, you've got a broad enough basket of product and opportunity to protect yourself in large part from any negative tax consequences or for the majority of negative consequences, tax consequences surrounding that sale. And that was a very good observation on your part that there's always been that, okay, you know, your CPA, well, you know, how much of my house, how much of my primary residence is going to squeeze into, you know, uh, you know, a home office, you know, to get that number down. Well, and, uh, and I'm not a CPA, so please take this great and grain of salt, and I'm not qualified to give tax advice, but I would think that with so many people working from home, there's going to be much greater ambiguity with regard to that now in terms of, well, how much of this can I wrap up that way? You know, so if my exclusion doesn't cover it, it will be eligible for 1031 exchange purposes into DST or, or anything else. And I think that's a point that's really worth uh, time and effort to, uh, to flesh out. Really well, awesome. I always think those allocations, even, even let's just look at a single family rental. I mean, who makes, if we look at, and there's something called cost seg. I mean, if you look at this off, office building, you're, you're going to have a cost segregation study that really just sort of accelerates uh, depreciation on the asset. But you might break this building into a couple hundred components. And, and you guys, I mean, in the DST world, DST sponsors typically are going to use that. But if you look at cost seg in the most basic sense, it's a rental house dirt to improvements, right? I mean, that's really not cost seg, but it is. I mean, you've got an allocation one way or another. Well, that same thing is applied to a primary residence with a home office. You think about what the gains cover and you think about who, who's putting the allocation on that rental house with dirt to improvements. Well, who can put those allocations on that on your primary residence to get rid of mitigate any ultimate tax consequence and i always say that that i think one of the most important people in your life these days is is your tax counsel your cpa doctor and, and cpa yeah. and, and quite honestly keep you alive and hold yeah. on to your money yeah and if you get a, if you get a good one honestly they might introduce you to somebody that ends up a friend too right i mean how'd we meet um, a long long time C ago a cpa yeah. well he wasn't quite the pocket protector CPA, no. right? I mean, I think Dale. the first time I met Dale, we Dale were, is a different, he, yeah, different kind of guy. He was doing taxes for my wife, and he said, hey, I want to go golf? And I figured, hey, this is a good way to go meet Dale. I'm thinking, okay, round of golf with a CPA, this ought to be fun. Boring. I get there, I, I get there, and he's wearing a black tank top, and, you know, hair's all frizzy, and, and uh, I think the, you know, first drive he hit, hit a 
car or something like that. It was a fun day. But anyway, you, you look at that and the people in your life, I, I just think great tax people are, are so important today because there's so many things. You know, rarely is a question whether you can or can't do is how you're going to do it. And, and a lot of the times that we're sort of pushing on lines, I advise my people, it's like, you need to work with somebody that's, we're, we're going to build the case for an audit we hope never comes, right? And But these allocations, whether it's dirt to improvements on a rental house, or if you've got a home office, what is or is not investment. And you think there's so many opportunities with a, a single asset sale where you're not talking physical breaks. You're not talking about two condos side by side with two buyers, two sales. You're talking about a duplex, half owner occupied. You're talking about somebody, a house with acreage. You're taking the house and the working land. And I'm just saying, as we're saying today, we are saying, you know, a home with a home office. And I would bet a lot of you out there are doing this today just by the vacancies in the building back behind me. I mean, it's not like people stop working. But I think that, that, that the sort of unforeseen byproduct of that is a positive, a net positive, because if you're selling a home with those gains well in excess of 250 or 500 you're looking for a way to keep your money yours anyway and that's really what my job is we like to say you've worked hard for your money we work hard to keep it yours and i think that going through a potential recessionary time if you want to get some money get access to stuff i mean i've got a client that i talked to last week and and actually i met him at a conference where i was speaking and and uh you know, he said, well, hey, I've got some questions and I, I don't know if I can do this. And so we actually talked about exchanging them out of some income properties into a new income property that was later going to be converted into a primary residence. And then he could sell his home and take that money tax free. That's patient money. Those with the gold make the rules. Right. So going in a recessionary time, if you can sort of free up some money there to go jump on those opportunities. That's a great thing. But what I wanted to say about the DST product, two things actually. One is is you've got immediacy of deployment. I mean, you guys, the, the product is there. It's not like you're waiting to fill a bucket before that purchase happens, before they're going to sell to the investors. But it's sitting there. You can if you're if you're somebody that's got rental houses and you've lived off the income of those rental houses for years, you can't have a gap in income, right? So you need that money deployed and working for you right away, which. The DST that's, product's going to do. That's something that, uh, that that we are asked a lot. At DSTs are fully stabilized assets, meaning they are. Uh, you're you're not going to find a development deal in the DST space. They have to be fully stabilized properties, meaning they're built out, they're occupied, and they're cash flowing. So there, as David just mentioned, there is there's minimal disruption of cash flow because there's always product, there's always inventory, and your cash flow on that DST property or property starts as soon as you close into that DST property because it's already cash flowing. So our job is to try to minimize the amount of downtime you experience in terms of when cash flow from property X starts and cash flow from properties Y and Z picks back up or starts it or starts restarts restarts it so. great great so i i was going to ask you something else but i'm going to kick it off to the next section so uh, once again david more equity advantage and robert smith peregrine private capital and don't go away because we're going to talk a little bit more about loans on these things and 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 what the nature of them is and uh, i think you'll find that uh, very interesting and important to understand so once again, don't go away. We'll be right back. Bye-bye.